May the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, my Lord and Redeemer, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Please be seated. This morning, um, the Old Testament prophecy, as I was looking at it for this week, um, it brought me to uh, thinking about Jesus Christ, particularly as the healer or the physician. And if you read the 38th chapter of this section of Ecclesiasticus, it's a beautiful forebearer of our sacrament of Holy Communion, uh, with Jesus Christ being the physician, the total physician. So I selected actually to compare with that 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, because St. Paul brings Ecclesiasticus forward into the New Testament. He says, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, because that's what it says in, the, in Ecclesiasticus. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus. And that is in the KJV version. Well, I went to a couple other versions just to see, because we tend to use these words differently. But I'll remind you, it says, And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved. In other translations, the three-part division of the spirit, soul, and body is something that you hear other people say, body, mind, and soul. People tend to put it in that order. That's an NIV order, a uh, different translation, a Protestant translation, but same concept and idea. These are the perceived three major areas in which human beings can suffer. And we all know what that means in mind, in spirit, soul, and body. We can suffer. We can suffer from wounds in all three dimensions of the human personality where healing action needs to take place. Now, two of these areas to any person in this world are pretty self-explanatory. The body. Well, that, that's a very clear statement. We're not talking about anything esoteric here. The healing of the body, which refers to our physical body. Problems that occur with our physical existence can certainly benefit from God's healing power. Similarly, the mind. And we've seen that. But many people of the world today, however, do not recognize that we humans being... We human beings are subject to the third one, spiritual disorders. We tend to forget that one. We always focus on mind and body, and spirit seems to be out in left field somewhere. It just doesn't, comp we don't comprehend that one too well. Those that disturb our relationship with God. In the realm of the spirit, two types of imperfections, I'm just going to get, you can kind of search your own. I've done this with myself as I'm writing this going, oh, heavens. I really have some work to do in these areas. But there are two types of imperfections that can occur for healing to come from God. The first type is an internal spiritual disorder. I, that's actually a phrase used in seminary. An internal spiritual disorder. It sounds like something in a Walmart. You know, it just too, it's too pat. Um, I would rather call it, in my own terms, the darkening of the soul. Think of it as the darkening of the brilliant light of your soul. That's really the disorder. It's a state of sin, a state of sin. As my mother used to say, she could count them on my fingernails, little white marks. As I mentioned before, I used to hide my hands in my pockets because I didn't want her to see all my little, I didn't know what they were, but I did them somewhere. Well, it's either you're very, very, you do very, very serious kinds of sins or minor infractions, like the little white marks on my fingernails. Our Roman Catholic brothers would describe these as what? Mortal sins and venial sins. The big guys and the little guys that we do. And then there is this awful continuous, and that's, you can find that in 1 John 5, 17, by the way. And then there's this awful continuous habit of sinning. And John comes back again, 1 John 3, 6, and describes that very potently, I think. Well, now the second type, that's the first type. Sinning, big, little, and having a habit of sinning. The problem with human beings is that we like habits. Think of it this way. If, as a human, you really don't have a lot of time. If you had to think about every person you know in every way that you know them, you would stand there all day long doing nothing but thinking all those, of all those facts. When you make dinner, do you really think about it? And I hope the, I can, I was going to say ladies, but I hope the guys help. Uh, do you really think about it? No. 
except you have to tell the guys what to do. But beyond that, you really know what to do and you get it done. You don't even think about it. Uh, I must tell you that when you memorize things, remember school? You don't even think about it, it just comes out. You have a capacity to take detail, box it up, put it away so you don't have to spend all that time. We do the same thing with sin. We get habits of sin. We forget we're even doing them, but they come out just like memorization does. It's a habit. We have to be careful. Now, the second type of spiritual order is, and this one we only see in movies. Not true. We need to think of this. It's external. And that occurs as a result of demonic attacks from the outside coming into your soul. The works of the evil one and his minions. And if you want a really fun list of those, again, read C.S. Lewis. The screw tape letters. I mean, just listen to screw tape. One, two, three. He, he tells his minion exactly what sins he wants the people to commit. And it, even if you read mere Christianity, there's a whole bunch of cool ones in there too that are listed. All of C.S. Lewis's books are done so beautifully, you don't realize that he's listing everything, but you're having fun reading it. Now, the, if we were to go though from C.S. Lewis and go to something that Christ has said to us directly, let's go to the Our Father, the Lord's Prayer. It refers to all of it. We don't think of it that way, but the Lord, that's why the Lord's Prayer is so perfect. When we pray the petition, forgive us our trespasses, we are asking God to free us from the internal disorders, big ones, little ones, and the habits of sinning in our lives. Forgive us our trespasses. And then when we pray, what? The phrase that we don't really think about, deliver us from evil, the external attacking us. We are asking God to protect us from those external spiritual disorders that can be brought on by attacks of evil from the outside in, not from the inside out. By the way, it is from this last petition that we get the term deliverance prayer, if you've ever heard that term. It, the Protestant denominations use it a lot, uh, but we actually use it inside the Anglican faith too, the deliverance prayer, which is a kind of minor exorcism uh, performed by the prayer itself. Deliver us from evil. It's called the deliverance prayer or minor exorcism. So when you repeat the Our Father, you're actually repeating a self-exorcism that Christ created for us in all of the words that were put together. So, when we examine the realm of the human spirit or soul, we can see that there are not three, but four types of disorder. Physical, emotional, internal spiritual healing, external spiritual healing, or if you will, like they do in Hollywood, the expelling of spirits that are evil, keeping them away, expelling them. So where do we find the perfect vehicle for this healing? That's why I really liked our Old Testament reading and moving it to Thessalonians. Do we need a complex kind of toolbox with various ways to fix our problems? I, I'm sure there are people that will sell you those. All kinds of little booklets, all kinds of little, little things and protect yourself from sin, etc. Is there a need for a bunch of stuff uh, hidden in the coffers of members of clergy that we bring to bear in different situations and differing services? I mean, we, do we have little, like I was in the airport, I've shared it a long time ago with you all. Uh, I, was, I was walking through the airport with my little case with uh, uh, the communion elements in it. And I was actually getting on a plane and one man passed me by and says, is that your little magic box? That's what I mean. We don't have magic box. I said, yeah, come here. He took off. <laughs> Never back down from something like that. I, just, I think he learned something. I'm not sure. Don't do it again, maybe is what he learned. Well, no, we don't have this. Absolutely not. Do we have a magic box? Do we have any things that will do this? So what do we have? I mean, Christ already said he wouldn't allow us to be without defense. Well, we find everything that we need and everything that will cure our situation in one place. The sacrament of Holy Communion. One place. As we've discussed many times before, Jesus has revealed to us the fullness of life, which is health in the broadest sense. When we say, in, when you read scripture, fullness of life means health in all four areas. Fullness of life. And it's primarily given through the Holy Communion. John 6, uh, verse 57. 
As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. I mean, you can't get any more straightforward than that. We have already seen, too, that Jesus' words imply a habitual and frequent action. Unfortunately, C of E, as you know, C of E, Church of England, nah, what's the term? Christmas and Easter. Christmas and Easter, C of E. I show up at Christmas, I get communion. I show up at Easter, I get communion. That is not what Christ said. Christ said and implied it must be done regularly, if you will. We have already seen, too, that Jesus' words imply that. Whoever feeds on him that is fed by the communion habitually and frequently will have life abundantly. Those are his words. The important point to remember is that receiving Holy Communion is quite different in its healing function than the spiritual prayer for healing that we say over an individual as clergy. And you can as well. Particularly upon death, even you have the power to baptize. Upon death of that individual, you've been given that. The Eucharist is not merely some abstract spiritual contact with Jesus. You know, I, I feel good and... I'm going to go feel good the rest of this afternoon. Maybe not tomorrow morning. I've got to go back to work. But this afternoon, I'm going to feel good. In Holy Communion, we have direct... I, I, I can't... I, you know, it's glorious to me. We have direct physical contact. I mean, this is not something on another planet. We have direct physical contact with Jesus. Why is this so important? I mean... That's kind of a question that doesn't need answered, I guess. We that, when we study the gospel accounts of people being healed, what do we hear? We discover a notable fact. We see that everyone who touched Jesus was healed if, big if, put that in capitals, if they touched him with expectant faith. If the faithful touched him, they were healed. As we read in Matthew 14, 35, 36, quote, And when the men of that place had knowledge of him, they sent out into all that country round about and brought unto him all that were diseased and besought him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched were made perfectly whole. All four areas, perfectly whole. It is really monumental, and I think an astounding, and yet simple, so simple, no magic, no running around with special things. Simple. In Holy Communion, we touch Jesus and Jesus touches us. Even though our encounter with Jesus and Holy Communion might be temporary once a week, the effect is not. He's already told us it's lasting. It is a lasting, ongoing healing effect. We are grafted into Christ. We hear that a lot in the Bible. And we are united with him like branches united to the vine, as we read in John 15, 4. That's why immediately, right? I want you to think about this in today's Mass. Immediately after saying the Our Father together in the Mass, what does the priest do? The priest then immediately after that says, quote, We do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table. But thou art the same Lord whose property is always to have mercy. To always have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear son Jesus Christ and to drink his blood. And here the lights come up and the music plays. And we say that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body and our souls, body, soul, washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us, all four areas cleaned white. Beautifully stated, I think, in our, in our BCP. First, the priest says a prayer of deliverance, the Our Father, so that we might all be healed by any external attacks by the evil one. This is based on 1 Corinthians, by the way, 10.21. Quote, ye cannot, and this is a strong one, this is a strong statement. We have to listen to it. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. You can't get more clear than that. 
Second, the priest prays for societal or community healing, doesn't he? And third, the priest prays for the healing of our internal spiritual problems, and we offer up our own spirit, don't we? That's part of the prayer process for cleansing, asking God to free us from our state of sin. Finally, of course, there is the prayer of the centurion. That's the prayer we say together, and it is the nail that closes the door permanently on evil. What do we say? Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my soul shall be healed. The third part. It is all there in our Mass. If our spirit echoes a blessed assurance, I shall be healed, and if we do not mindlessly recite these words, then this simple prayer of expectancy can bring about some astounding results. As we read in Acts chapter 2, by the way, the Acts is usually brought to play when a priest is about ready to ask you for money. <laughs> the Acts church, and they donated everything, and so do you, and etc. But on the other side of it, it seems like the, the church of Acts was a little different than most today. They, they, if you look, read it, they behaved a little differently. Well, the reason that is, is because they were, quote, and it's used in scripture, devoted. They were devoted to the reading of scripture and the receipt of Holy Communion. They did two things. We worry about a whole bunch of stuff. They did two. Read scripture and received communion. They knew the simplicity of what God was about and all of the complexity that came through that. And because of this devout behavior, it was also a time of when? The growth of the church. All the people worried about was reading God's word and receiving God physically. And the church grew boundlessly. And we worry about, let's see, what do we worry about? We worry about a whole bunch of stuff. Those are the two that are the most important. They truly knew that Christ was with them, touching them, healing them, the sacrament of Holy Communion. I wonder if you and I really know that. I want you to come to the altar rail today with what is written in, in uh, scripture with great expectancy, knowing that this is the greatest sacrament and healing action available to anyone, anytime, anywhere. Your receipt of the greatest gift of healing is not by the use of oils. It can be. By the way, the use of oils is not really a sacrament, but it can be. Use of oils can be good. And they were directed as clergy to provide that grace through God to you. But there is no other sacrament. There is no other place to get total healing. It says it in our BCP. It says it in scripture. The clergy or any other process of the church outside the liturgy of the mass, you are healed in one condition and in one condition only, your personal relationship with Christ. You can do anything you wanna do, but you're not gonna receive healing until you actually receive him in your heart in wonder and in glory. The greatest gift from Jesus Christ to you individually, personally, lovingly is what? The sacrament, of, he gave it to you, the sacrament of Holy Communion. He's giving you himself, but you have to come to him. You receive him physically. Come to the communion rail today and you in fact will be embracing Christ, literally. And he will literally be embracing you I have no doubt that healing will come from that. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.